this, our uh, guest speaker today is Gabriela Loren. Gabriela is the founding partner of the Loren Manke, uh, one of the leading independent tax and uh, accounting firms for small business in BC. Um, she's for 20 years uh, related with the tax and tax accounting. Gabriela has been tireless advocate to providing people with practical, reliable, professional advice in the way that em empowers them financially, either as individuals or business owners. Gabriela has served uh, various community organizations, including the West Vancouver uh, Chamber of Commerce, the Lionsgate Hospital Foundation, and uh, she's been the uh, numerous of awards, including Best Business Person in the North Shore Alpine Woman of Excellence. Well, she has been uh, featured as a financial expert on Global TV, City TV, Financial Post, Vancouver Sun, Business in Vancouver, Community Newspapers, and the Canadian Living uh, Magazine. She has also background to work in the government as a tax auditor in nine years. And uh, uh, also she's uh, focusing on the small uh, uh, business. I would like to introduce you, Gabriela. And thank, thank you. you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having me here today. One of the reasons when I was talking to Matt, I said, I'd love to speak to your group about some of the things that are affecting small business because CRA has just hired a whole bunch of new auditors. And so what we're finding is we're getting people who are being audited on all sorts of different issues. And when it comes to small business, there's just a matter of doing a few things differently than what you're doing now and that'll prevent you from hopefully being audited or at least drawing them to your attention. So some of the things that we talk about for tax sense, okay, yeah, there we go is there's three pillars that we're gonna talk about this morning. One is allowable deductions. The other one is GST methods and the other trick on incorporation. So when you're looking at allowable deductions, the thing to look at there is allowable deductions is the same word that we use for write-offs, the expenses you can deduct from your income. So there's a few items that have what I would call some little bit of quirkies that people are not aware of. And the biggest one is the difference between advertising and promotion versus meals and entertainment. So I'm sure you already know that on some of the meals and entertainment that you're only about to deduct 50 cents on the dollar. But because of that rule, there is a huge difference between advertising promotion and meals and entertainment because advertising and promotion is at 100 cents on the dollar. The most common way of doing write-offs these days when it comes to businesses and advertising and promotion, yes, you do your website, Yes, you do your handouts and flyers and, your, and, and you might put ads in the paper, but the bigger one is people are giving gift cards. They're giving gift cards to their clients to say, thank you for a business referral. They're giving it as someone saying, hey, would you like, you know, thanks for, for meeting with me and spending a few minutes of time with me. Those gift cards are a great way to say thank you, but it also opens up a whole big can of worms. So first of all, CRA has an issue where they say if you give someone a gift card that is more than a nominal amount, there could be a taxable benefit to the recipient. So what that means is that if you give a gift card for more than $25, CRA could say that you should pay tax on that. So can you imagine if you have a client who you just sold a house to and they've just paid you a mega commission, we'll let everyone interpret what mega is, a mega commission, and you give them a $500 gift card to the beach house. And you have to tell them we have to wait till it's to reopen. But you give them this beautiful gift card, and they think, oh, this is fantastic. And all of a sudden, you have to give them a slip at the end of the year saying, please pay tax on this $500. So there is an issue there in that there's not a lot of clarity. In the case of restaurant gift cards, there is a court case on that. And most people are not even aware of it, but it happened back in the mid 2000s. So around 2005, CRA did an audit of a realtor by the name of Mr. Shipley. Mr. Shipley used to give out gift cards to his clients to restaurants to say thank you. Well, CRA audited him. They found he had all the receipts and he had written on the back who he gave it to and why he had given them these gift cards. CRA was acceptable and they accepted that, but they said, you gave out a restaurant a gift card to a restaurant, therefore it's meals and entertainment, not advertising and promotion. And so they disallowed half of the deduction. He went to the appeals division, it was denied. He went to the federal court of appeal and it was accepted. 
the auditor, the judge said, absolutely, you've got letters from your clients proving you didn't enjoy the breakfast or lunch or dinner with them, but now we think it should be advertising promotion. They hadn't even returned back to the office with his lawyer when they were notified CRA filed an appeal. Um, the BC Supreme Court of Appeal read, had, uh, looked at the case and the judge said to Mr. Shipley, Mr. Shipley, I'm sorry, I know what you were doing was advertising and promotion, but because the gift cards were to restaurants, unfortunately it's meals and entertainment. So, you know, the it makes it very difficult for business owners because you're wondering how do you thank your clients? So here's a few tips. You always want to make sure you give a gift of an actual gift, because that is at 100 cents on the dollar. If you give a gift basket, you're totally fine. If you give a gift card, don't do it to a restaurant. So, and you might as well start selling your shares in Starbucks now. <laughs> but, but the idea is you want to give it to Home Depot or HomeSense or something where you can actually buy a physical gift without meals. Costco is an iffy. So again, buy someone the barbecue and give them the gift enclosure rather than the gift card. There are a few exceptions to that 50% rule that a lot of businesses are not aware of as well. You are allowed to have up to two events a year where you spend no more than $150 per person and that event is considered a business function and therefore is at 100 cents of the dollar. So in our firm, we have the after tax season party where we invite, bless you, all of our, our staff and their spouses and we're allowed to spend $150 per person and that's 100% tax deductible. If we do it at Christmas time, we do the same thing. If we give a gift, we're allowed to give a gift to each employee without them having to pay tax of no more than $500. So as long as we keep it under that, there's a couple little tidbits on how you can avoid having an issue with CRA. Yes? May I ask a question? Um, I just, I had a lot of gift cards or gift certificates as prizes for our riders. Mm -hmm. Given by restaurants for say that's 50 okay. or 100, is that okay? That's totally fine okay. because those are ones out of their own inventory. And so it's not costing them anything. It's if you go and buy one at a restaurant and then gift ah, it, okay. that's where you have the problem. Okay. So you're okay accepting those and ask them a little more. Another issue that has a, a big thing under CRA's radar right now is telecommunications. What we normally say is take your cell phone bill, your home phone bill, your business long distance, any business lines, fax lines, internet expenses, throw it all together. And when you add it all up, there's your telecommunication cost. When CRA audits you, they're asking, how did you get to that number? So if you spend an average $200 a month, you have a total of $2,400. So you have that and you put the claim in on your tax return, that's great except CRA knows that you called your daughter and wished her happy birthday. And there is personal use. So if there is personal use, you cannot claim 100%. And so because of that, you always want to allocate a small personal use portion of your telecommunications costs. Just because your daughter is sitting there playing World of Warcraft on your internet, I know she's over there, <laughs> notice I look at you and said, then that's, your, that's personal use. You have to allocate a portion of it. CRA's go-to, if you have claimed 100% of your telecommunications costs, is to disallow half of it. It's only half business now. The other half is personal. However, if you've allocated a personal portion and you say, okay, I had 2,400 in total, but I think I, there's probably at least $300 a year that's personal, so I'm only gonna claim on my tax return $2,100. Now the onus of proof has shifted to CRA now having to prove that that $300 is too low and they won't go through the hassle. So just making a small allocation for personal use on something like telecommunications is a great asset for your business. And keep in mind, you know, when you think of it, you didn't claim $300 at the top tax bracket, that's $150 in taxes. Is it really worth going through losing half of your write-off at $1,200 for the sake of $150 on a regular basis? So good idea there. Automobile expenses. This is a category that is a hot topic. We've had five audit requests for automobile only on our businesses in the last four months. 
five audits. Wow, that's what we said. Oh my goodness. So the first thing when you uh, to understand why CRA is doing this is to understand how the claim is made. So when you have a car expense that you are using and, and the business either owns the car or you are using your personal car for the business, the first step is to figure out which car are you using? So say for instance, you and your spouse both use the car for business, well, which car goes out the driveway first is usually the one that's being used for business that day. Or if you're like some people have more than one car, not mentioning any names, then, then the idea is, only because I've seen them drive around the building a couple times, but uh, you might have different cars used at the same time. So you wanna keep track of your expenses on a per car basis. The expenses you have are your gas, your insurance, and here's the first audit trigger. If it's not registered for business use on every single vehicle you're claiming for business, they disallow the expense completely. You get zero business use on the car. So you always wanna make sure you have business use insurance on your car. If you have repairs and maintenance, that includes smelly things hanging from the rear view mirror, new tires, oil changes, insurance deductibles, anything along those lines. If you have Lease costs, you get a lease cost. And if you own your car and you have a loan on it, you get the loan interest, not the payments, just the interest portion. Then they wanna know how many kilometers you drove in the year. Well, if you put a reminder in your calendar that on December 31st, how far did I drive? Then at least you know that one number, how many kilometers did you drive? Because the other number then is how many kilometers were used for business purposes. You add up all of your expenses, but one of the ones that's not there and it's missed a lot of times when it comes to people who are first starting a business, and that is you always want to have the car when you start a business, what is the value of the car on the day you started your business? If you buy one, it's easy, but if you have already own one, you want that value as well. Because when you take all of that together and you mush in all the expenses, this is how CRA makes your claim. You take your business kilometers, divide it by your total kilometers, multiply by your cost, there's your tax write-off. But when you're looking at this, there's a number of different things to keep in mind. First of all, should you buy or lease a car if you're running a business? Leasing costs, there is a limit of $800 per month plus PST and GST that you get to claim as your total cost. When you buy a car, you have a total of $30,000 for a gasoline engine car that you're allowed to write off, plus the cost of PST and GST, and that is the maximum that you can spend. So you may buy a car for $100,000, but you're still only allowed to write off 30. Then there are also interest limits in that you're only allowed to claim a maximum of $10 a day. With the interest at that amount, you're never gonna go over it with our current interest rates, so you're okay there. The question of buying or leasing a car is more one of your own personal benefit, your own personal wants. Are you the type of gal that likes a new car every couple of years? Then you're probably a lease person. If you're the type of person that might want to drive a car until it's dead, you're always a buy person. So know what kind of a car owner you are to make that claim. Once you decide on buying or leasing and you're doing your write-off, the logbook is where CRA will nail you big time. Question number one, whenever there's an audit for automobile is, do you have a logbook? And your answer should always be, yes, I have a logbook. And they will then want to see the logbook. So I was audited by CRA in 2017, first time in 30 years. So I started my practice in 89, so we just had our 30th anniversary. So in the first 28 years, nothing, and all of a sudden, boom, I got audited for my automobile expense. And they asked about my logbook. I had not kept a logbook, but what I did keep was all the records to enable me to prepare a logbook. I had my day timer where I knew everywhere I was. I also had all the receipts for every expense that I had. I also had my, uh, my service log so I knew what my mileage was. So I was able to recreate it. And I did it on a simple formula of an Excel spreadsheet where I went one to 31 down the side, January to December across the top, and then I had a little Google Maps summary where I said, okay, from Caulfield in the house to the Lionsgate Hospital Foundation, because I sit on the board there, and then from, from the Lionsgate Hospital Foundation to the office. I had all the different kilometers on where I went. 
So I was able to plug into my graph that I had created. On this day, I drove to and from Small Business BC or to and from the Real Estate Board, and I was able to recreate my logbook. At the end of the day, you have to make a logbook for one full year. Once you have a logbook for one full year, it'll determine your business write-off percentage. So say that's 80%. So now you're writing off 80% of all of your car expenses that we just calculated. Then in the second year, you have to do your logbook for three months, January, February, March, or whatever your fiscal year is. And if in those three months, you're within 10% of what you claimed in the prior year, you can stop your logbook for the year. So if you went un down as low as 72 or up as high as 88, you were fine staying and not doing your logbook for the next nine months. But then you would do it again for the first three months of the next year to recalculate. Well, when I had done my audit in 2016, I was, I was claiming 80% business use of my car. In the first three months, I'm stuck at my desk preparing tax returns. So I didn't have a lot of mileage. I think I was about 62% business kilometers. So I'm like, oh darn, now I have to do my logbook for the balance of the year. By the time I hit the end of the year, I was at 78%. Great, I'm within that 10%, I'm a happy girl, and CRA accepted it. Then I did the first three months of 2018. So when I did those, I was again way under. I was not as bad as the year before, I was only about 71%, but it wasn't within the 10%, so I had to continue on. Even by the time the audit occurred in June, up until the end of May, my logbook showed I was still only at about 72%. But the CRA auditor said, that's fine, we see you do a lot more mileage in the, in the summer and subsequent months, so that's okay. I came out of that audit in all of 45 minutes, the audit was done, and I got a letter about two weeks later saying no adjustments. So it was well worth the 10 hours it took me to reconstruct my logbook in the first time in 30 years. But it was worth it because I had all the records. But just doing those little things is of having those records, you can, there's a number of apps out now. Google Maps apparently has an app that you can use if you just put on your location server on your cell phone. And then you can download it every day. Or you can do something, I think there's one called My Mileage or something along those lines. There's different apps that you can use. But that is one of the biggest things you want to make sure you do for your business is keep track of your mileage because CRA is looking at this as a big audit trigger right now. The next thing I wanted to talk about is the pay per kilometer rate because a lot of people just go, oh, I'll just pay myself a per kilometer rate. You can only do that if you are an employee of your own company or an employee of somebody else's. So you might be getting, a, unless you get a car lend, you probably get a per kilometer rate. That is the rate for 2019 is 58 cents for the first 5,000 kilometers and 52 cents a kilometer after 5,000. So you can do that, but if you are self-employed, operating as a sole proprietor, that is not allowed. It's only if you're an employee of your own company. Electric car, you may have heard this came out in the last budget. If it's not an electric car, you're still at $30,000. But if it's an electric car, you get to write off 100% of the cost of the electric car as long as it's under $55,000 plus taxes. The write-off is all in year one, so it would all be, if you bought it in 2019, it would all be 100% write-off in 2019. Unfortunately, if you sell the car in 2020, whatever you sold it for becomes income. So just be aware of that, because some people are going, oh great, I'll just buy a car and then sell it the next, yeah, it doesn't work that way. And it's not law yet. So this is only, it was in the proposed, um, in, the, in the budget release in, in this earlier this year, the actual law would not go in until October. Depending on when on October, it may or may not go through. So just be aware of that and don't run out and buy a $55,000 electric car, just in case. Uh, GST methods. There's something on GST that I find is very interesting that I'm surprised so many people don't know about. And that is that there's actually three methods of GST. There's something called the simplified method, which we don't recommend, but it works very well for nonprofit organizations and other organizations that might have to collect GST but not have a lot of paperwork. And that's because you can just calculate out the GST on every expense that you have. It's a calculation method. It doesn't work very accurately, so we don't recommend it, but it is a method that's out there. 
The regular method is probably the one you're most familiar with, where you take the GST that you've collected from your clients, subtract it from the GST that you've paid on any supplies or services, and the net difference goes to CRA. The quick method is meant to be for those of you who might be numerically challenged. And if you are, then there's a really quick way of doing the GST that can also make you money. So here's a quick comparison. If you have had sales of under 400,000, that's the first criteria for using the quick method. So under the regular method, if you had $100,000 in sales, you would collect 5,000 from your clients. On top of that, so your total sales are 105,000. Under the quick method, that wouldn't change. You still collect $5,000 in GST from your clients. They don't know any different. Where the difference comes in is when you have operating expenses. So this is where you would say, how much GST did you pay on 50% of the meals and entertainment, because you're only allowed 50% of the GST, or 80% of the GST paid on your car expenses, and then you calculate out everything else, and as I said, sometimes you have to do some numerical gymnastics, but let's say in this example you paid out $640. Notice how there's nothing for this under the quick method, because the quick method you do not have to break out all the GST on your expenses. But you probably know there's also the write-off for the GST you have on your capital purchases. You bought a new photocopier, some new office equipment. That GST, say that's $500, you still get that if you are under the quick method. So under the regular method, you would get pay out to CRA $3,860. Under the quick method, it's a calculation you give them 3.6% of your sales plus GST. So that's 3.6% of 105,000. Then you subtract from that, instead of the operating expenses, they give you a 1% credit on the first 30,000. So they give you a $300 credit of that. And you still get the GST paid on all your big ticket purchases. Look at the difference in what you end up sending to CRA. You just saved $880. It works really, really well if the expenses on which you pay GST are 30% or less than your income. Anyone in the consulting business, you can do this. Unfortunately, if you are in the financial services industry, you're not allowed to be numerically challenged. So <laughs> you're not allowed to use that method. So I'm not allowed to use it even though most of my costs are non gst -able because it's mostly staff salaries. So it's something to think about if you're in the consulting industry because it does, as quickly as I did that calculation speaking, is as quickly as you actually get to have that right off. Now the last one I want to talk about because it's something new for 2018 is incorporation. So normally if your business is making a profit and if that business profit is more than what you need to live on, you would incorporate your business. And the reason why you would incorporate your business is because there's such a difference between personal and corporate tax rates. So in 2019, the federal tax rate and the provincial tax rate jumps anywhere from 20% up to 49 point, oh sorry, is, yeah, 49.8%. But it's an escalating scale. So that 49.8% will not kick in until your income is in excess of 210,000. The corporate tax rate for 2019 is 12%. So just looking at that alone, and that 12% applies to the first $500,000 of business profits. So if you earn $100,000 as a sole proprietor, you are paying tax of around $28,000 with CPP and taxes, whereas as a corporation you're paying 12,000. Seems like the complete no-brainer. But the problem is you need some money to live on. And that is where you have to take out for the money that you earn from your business, either wages or dividends. So those wages are that, go ahead if you have to. Leave. No, no, I, I'm just gonna take care. We have a, a hard stop at 830. Yep, no problem. I want you, I want you to stick around. Because yep, really I'll do it really, this. really quickly. So, so, so wages so. and dividends, and there is some profits that you can save in the company, but there's new tax rates on that one. Uh, I'm not gonna go through that quickly. The tax rates from passive income, these are new, are uh, Gabriel, 4 to hold it, percent. Yep. I don't want you to hurry to the presentation. Okay. Some people, of course, that are American challenged and don't have business 
might want to go home because it's a hard stop at 8.30. Okay. But if you could stick around. And I will do that. Feet, if anybody wants to leave, I think, you know, as you know. It's That's a good idea. Thank cold. you. And then the rest of us can stay, and then I will thank you. Okay, perfect. Finish. Okay, anyone have to leave quickly? Otherwise, I'll go through it. I'll back to here. Okay, I'll do a really quick one. So, you can pay wages to family members. That's still allowed, except they have to be reasonable and for services provided. As of January 1st, 2018, you're not allowed to pay dividends to family members unless they provide services to your business or have assumed debt or have some other invested interest that where they've provided it for the business in the past. This is a huge tax break, uh, tax loss for small businesses because a lot of times there hasn't been the spouse working in the business actively in the current years but possibly in the major in the past ones. So this has been a real big issue for a lot of businesses. The idea is that you're still going to keep a bunch of money in the company but there's different tax rates depending on what kind of investment income you earn. The tax rate as I said for a corporation is 12%. But the tax rate for investment income is 45%. So you, all of a sudden you go, well, why would I keep a whole bunch of money in my company? And that's because the 45% the is split into two tax brackets. One, 19%, which is the raw tax, and 26%, which is the refundable tax. And that refundable tax is triggered the minute you pay out dividends from your company. So the, the end all tax rate that a company pays is only 19%. So it's a pretty good deal, but if your income from your investments in your business are in excess of 50,000, there's now a clawback on the small business deduction that brings you down to that 12% rate to the point where, well, how much, what are you investing in? The difficulty that I have with these new rules mm -hmm. is that if you're in a business of owning a building that your property owns and you have a huge capital gain, you've just lost that 12% tax rate because you've sold the business that year and you've made more than $50,000. So you just have to be very careful about that. So talk to your accountant, ask them questions and see where they're going, where they might be able to help you out. Okay, any questions? I'm going to thank you and then I have a couple of questions. Absolutely. <laughs> As you know, I'm, a, I'm an SCPA, so I've been retired for a number of years. But first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. I found it very interesting. Mm -hmm. very so rather than giving you a coffee cup or a pen, what we do is we make a donation on your behalf to nice. your application of polio, which thank is you you. one of the fundamental uh, aspects of our Rotary International. So I'm going to give you that. Thank you very much. I'm going to thank you very much. And then I'm going to just add two more things that people might be interested in. One of them is a lot of people telecommute nowadays. Yes. Home office. So home office expenses, because of time limitations, I took it out of the presentation. Oh. But home office, you are allowed to claim a percentage of your home office use based on the square footage of the office space exclusively used for business, <coughs> divided by the whole square footage of the house, multiplied by operating mm -hmm. expenses only. That means your hydro, your gas, your insurance, property taxes, mortgage interest, repairs and maintenance, not improvements, and strategy, special levy, sewer and water we have in West Van. So those are all operating expenses, but never ever claim any of the improvement costs and you're okay. You won't pay tax when you sell the house, you won't lose your principal residence exemption, so long as you never claim any mortgage payments that you paid off, any depreciation or any capital improvements. Next one is destruction of records. Ah. For a lot of people, you have your drafts full of boxes of records. When can people get rid so of So you can get rid of your records after seven years. You're supposed to get your permission from CRA to do that. However, there's a number of records you never, ever want to destroy. One is your 1994 tax return if you took advantage of the secondary property capital gains exemption. If you're not sure, just keep that one year. We have been asking for this for our clients who sell their cottage property and we've had some issues trying to get a hold because CRA does not keep a copy of it. The other ones is any documents pertaining to assets that you've bought beyond the seven year limit. So if you bought a car, 
if you bought a photocopier, anything along those lines, property transfer documents for the statement of adjustments when you buy property, always keep those. After the seven years, you can get rid of anything. But be aware that CRA cannot audit you beyond a three-year statute of limitations. And it's three years from the notice of assessment. So your 2016 personal tax return, assuming it was filed on time, would say it was assessed May the 1st, 2006, uh, 2017, will go statute barred on May the 1st, 2020. Prior to that, CRA cannot open up that tax year. So 2015 and prior are now completely statute barred if you filed on time, as long as there was no fraud, tax evasion, or tax avoidance. So I'm okay. assuming that you wouldn't have any of that. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? No. Yes. Otherwise, yes. Um, what would your recommendation be for, for example, investment for rental income? For both It depends on where the money is coming from for the purchase of the property. If you're borrowing it 100% and you have your own corporation, my recommendation would be to buy it through your personal name. Because of the passive tax rules on the corporation, it makes it a lot harder and instead reduce your personal income from your corporation in the years that you might have high rental income or that you have a capital gain personally. So if you have all the money in your corporation though, and the money is sitting there, you're better off to use that after-tax money to buy the property than you are personal. Because the personal after-tax money is probably 50 cents on the dollar money. So you're better off to buy it through the corporation. So it all depends on how you're financing and where the down payment's coming from. Yeah. Um, so if we're financing it like by ourselves, not borrowing, do you think that it's better to fund the company corporation for that or uh, make it personal investment? If you have the money in the corporation, you're probably better off still to do it in the corporation. $2,000. Yeah. <laughs> but if there's personal use of the property, in other words, it's a cabin up at Whistler, you want to keep it out of corporations if you can avoid it. Because CRA is looking for fair market value rent for however long you have that property. So, yeah, so in other that. words, we don't have to fund that, uh, we don't have to Let's say we don't have any corporation yet. Do we have to, is it better uh, to fund a corporation for that purpose or just make it personal investment? Just make it personal if that's the case. It's better. Yeah, okay. it's Thank better. You. And try to put it between you and your spouse because that helps as well. Brackets. Yeah, yeah brackets. Okay. And exactly. consult a, a CPA <laughs> or a, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I've got some business cards on the desk. If anyone has any questions, I have, I'm retired. I sold out of my practice August of 2016. So all I'm doing now is speaking engagements and having a great time meeting people. And running for office. We won't go there. <laughs> but I have my business cards say Team Tax Sense because it is basically our team at the office. I understand you know Kate Jessup. She's the other significant other of one of my partners, Brett Favan. And so they would be great to talk to, and we always give an hour of free consultation for anyone who wants to have a sit, sit down and ask questions like you just talked about.